things to talk about. So stick around. We'll be right back. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Uh, this is Seeking Sustainability Life number 193 and this is our very first one to talk about outer space. I am so excited. Thank you so much for joining, Elizabeth. Thank you, JJ. <laughs> it's great to have you here. I've really enjoyed reading your book. I'm reading on the Kindle. Um, I've also been listening to your uh, lectures. You've done a TEDx talk. I've gone through your press releases about your work with JAXA. I'm a big fan. You're doing a great job and I love how you're bridging the unknown to the known of the public without too much jargon. Um, yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your journey, how you ended up at JAXA? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, I started on a, a pretty traditional academic career. So I did a degree in theoretical physics in the UK and I carried on to a PhD in the UK. And then after that, for an academic career, it's common to do postdoctoral fellowships. And these are typically short term, fixed term contracts. And in some ways, that's a bit of a nuisance because you have to move quite often. But it's a pretty easy way to get a visa if you want to move to another country. So I went to the States and I went to Canada and I actually did my first trip to Japan during that time where I spent four months at the National Observatory in Mitaka in Tokyo. Tokyo. And actually at the end of that, I said, this is great. You know, can I come back? And they said, well, you can come back as a postdoc, but we typically do not hire foreign faculty members because they need to teach in Japanese. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's definitely not happening. <laughs> So I went and did my next postdoc, which was already lined up and in Canada, and I had a great time there. And I should have been applying for faculty positions. And I was thinking, I really want to go back to Japan. Maybe I could do another postdoc. No one would even notice, you know. But actually, around, around, around the time I was thinking of making this probably quite unwise career move, I was contacted by Hokkaido University in Sapporo. And they said, we are introducing a new international program in physics. We want people to be able to teach in English. Are you interested? And I said, hell yes, sign me up. So I applied for that position and I got it. And I moved for, I moved to Sapporo just after actually the major earthquake in July 2011. And I stayed there for five years. And I was an assistant professor there and I tenured and became associate. Um, but I was getting more and more into science communication. Uh, I've always enjoyed writing. I've been very passionate about it for a long time. And Hokkaido supported that. They were very happy for me to write. But as a professor in the physics department, I had a lot of other duties. You know, I had to teach. I had to do research. So it was something I always had to do on the side. They couldn't actually allow it to be part of my job, like in a sort of protected time sort of way. So I was starting to look around for other opportunities and a position opened up at JAXA. And so I emailed them and I said, look, my research isn't exactly connected with a JAXA mission. And normally they hire people to work very much with the satellite and spacecraft data. And I said, I'm, I'm a theorist. So um, actually, I, I just need a computer. <laughs> but I said, you know, your English outreach is a lot weaker than your domestic outreach. And, you know, I've done a lot of writing. I'm just about to finish my first book. How about it? And they said, you know what? We're going to take a gamble on this. Uh, yes. And so I started there. Um, it will be, I guess, four or five years ago now. And uh, I joined as a kind of joint researcher and science communicator down at JAXA. And I've been working particularly on the public relations for the Hayabusa 2 mission, which I'm hoping uh, quite a few of you will have heard about because it recently returned to Earth with a sample from an asteroid uh, in December. And I'm also working on the outreach uh, for the other missions when they need me, in particular, our new upcoming uh, Martian Moon Exploration Mission. Wow, fantastic. Uh, I was really impressed when I heard that story that you basically created your own position. 
you saw that JAXA, who you really admired, needed someone in communications and to be like outreach in English. And you created that position and you're helping to be the bridge for all the great work that they're doing, which is mostly just in Japanese. You're now communicating it to the world. And、uh, you, you mentioned somewhere that Google Translate is your friend. But I, think, <laughs> but I think the basic understanding, it's not just a translator. You have、mm. the understanding. And I think it's not just Google Translate. You have some funny stories of mis- mistranslation. <laughs>、yeah. um, but having that base of understanding, I'm sure, helps a lot with、um, helping Google Translate get it right. Is that right? Yeah, I, th- I think that's absolutely true. I mean, what Google has to do is it has to get it to the point that I understand it. It doesn't have to give me perfect English, it just needs to make it understandable for me. And as soon as I understand what's been said, which I do with you know, really a lot of Google Translate and then some very basic knowledge of Japanese grammar, so that if it gives me garbage, I can split the sentence sort of in the right places to get the right, get the meaning through.、Um, and then I rewrite it. And it was true that JAXA did not advertise for a science communicator. And I think what I learned from the experience of approaching them and saying, could I apply for a more science communication role, was that if there's something you want to do, you should tell people <laughs> because you never know.、Um, they won't know you want to do it, and you won't know whether actually they would consider it unless you vocalize and say, look, this is what I'd really like to see myself doing. And you can, you can never tell when that's going to come off. Yeah. Well, great. Good on you. I think a, a lot of people would just read it and feel like, well, I'm not qualified. I'm not going to apply.、Um, so, putting yourself out there and trying, there's no harm in trying and、Absolutely. being a communicator and asking. That's the best, <laughs> best way forward. So, good job. <laughs> It's a demonstration of what I was talking about.、So、yes, <laughs> exactly. Exactly.、Um, let's start with probably the difficult question that you are asked all the time. So, when your whole book is about the Planet Factory, are, is there habitable planets out there? Can I just do the short answer for you because I've been listening to all your lectures? Yes. <laughs> So, so basically, it sounds like Earth is really, really special. And just by chance or by many amazing interactions between asteroids and many different things, Earth is very unique. And there isn't really anything like Earth that we know of right now, but there's just a tiny, tiny bit that we know. And so, it sounds so interesting. Your job is all about discovering. New things all the time. Is it, did I get close? <laughs> uh, close. I mean, I would say it's not that we think necessarily the Earth is unique. We just don't know. I mean, there could be billions of Earths, but there could be absolutely zero apart from the one we're on. We, we have absolutely no idea at the moment. So it's,、um, we only discovered the first planets outside our solar system in the early 1990s. So we've come a huge way in a very short time, which is why this journey is so exciting. But it's too early to jump the gun and start saying that we understand what the planets we found are like. At the moment, when you detect a planet, you only get some very basic measurements. You tend to get a radius and or a kind of mass measurement or a minimum mass measurement. And to give you an idea of how little that tells us, Venus and the Earth are almost exactly the same size. So we can tell you we have found an Earth like planet. An equally true statement would be we found a Venus like planet. We can't tell the difference yet based on the measurements we've made. Now, the only other way of distinguishing between those planets is you can say, oh, well, Venus is not in what we call the so called habitable zone.、Um, and that's definitely true. So we could say, OK, a y it's the same size as Venus and Earth and it's in the habitable zone. But that still doesn't really narrow it down much because the habitable zone is the region around a star where a planet that was the same as the Earth. Could support liquid water. So, for example, Mars is in our habitable zone, but doesn't support liquid water on its surface. So, you know, you can narrow it down and say you've got something that's roughly the same size as the Earth and it receives similar amounts of sunlight, but we don't know anything else. So, at the moment, it's just too early to say whether there's a lot of Earths or there's absolutely no Earths. Are we rare? Are we common? We, we just do not know yet.、Uh, that's the job actually for the next generation of telescopes, which is super exciting. So I get a bit frustrated by the media saying, oh, the next Earth 2.0. And I'm like, guys, 
you have a radius there. That's it. That's all you've got. And I feel it spoils the journey for everyone because, like I say, we've only just really started finding planets outside our solar system. So if you jump the gun and say, hey, we found another Earth, you're depriving people of actually the journey to find another Earth or maybe never to find another Earth. That would also be really exciting to find some really alien landscapes that are completely different from what we've experienced. So I get really, you know, sort of even sometimes upset by the media saying we found Earth 2.0 because I'm like, you're depriving people of following along on that journey. And it's going to be absolutely amazing, but it's going to take us a little time yet. From your talk in Canada to the PI Institute, I, I watched that lecture. Really fascinating. I'm going to put a link below if people want to watch it. I definitely recommend it. You explain a lot in detail. It's really worth watching. Uh, one of the things you just mentioned is about when water was found on a planet and the press went crazy <laughs> saying it's habitable. And you actually have said a few times, we shouldn't call it a habitable zone. We should call it a habitable hunting zone or something because it gives the wrong impression. Can you talk about that a little bit? So the, the planet in question um, was, I've forgotten its name. It's got a, some completely unmemorable acronym, but it was very exciting because it was in this so-called habitable zone and there was a detection of water. However, if you look a little bit closer, so this was, this was a planet that was actually a bit larger than the Earth. And they also, they actually did detect the atmosphere for it. So it is a very exciting discovery because it's one of the first small-ish planets where we've actually been able to probe that atmosphere. And this is what our next generation of telescopes is really setting up to do. We're just on the brink of moving between, yes, we found a planet, to being able to say, and we know something about it. We're right on that edge right now. And this is one of the smallest planets that we've been able to actually detect the atmosphere in and start to say what's in that atmosphere. And one of the things they found in that atmosphere was H2O, which sounds fantastic. But they, the models for the atmosphere also suggest it contains a lot of hydrogen. And hydrogen is also a greenhouse gas like carbon dioxide. So that means that if you're a planet with a lot of hydrogen on, you're basically wearing a much thicker coat than the Earth is wearing. So the amount of sunlight the Earth needs to get its temperature just about right is going to be too much for a hydrogen coated planet because it's got a much thicker coat on it. So it actually needs to be in a cooler area to have you know, the same sort of surface temperature. And also hydrogen itself is, um, it can produce very high pressures on the surface, even a small amount of hydrogen. You can end up with pressures that are similar to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. So again, not really the sort of place you'd wanna hang out too much. So this was, this was an exciting discovery because it was one of the first planets sort of in the right region for an Earth where we actually managed to detect uh, some of the composition of the atmosphere. Earth-like, the water probably isn't liquid. It's almost certainly vapour. It's probably got hydrogen in its atmosphere that we don't. And the surface uh, conditions are therefore quite likely to be more like a sort of mini Neptune than um, an Earth-like planet. Well, it, so many examples from your book and from the, the lectures. You're very good at communication. I can see why Jack says pleased with you, I hope. <laughs> I love your example of with the coat on as the way to explain how atmosphere is so important when talking about planets and how planets might be similar to Earth. And Earth's atmosphere is is very unique in, in that it can sustain life and, and keep our air. And uh, some of the planets you're talking about in the book are water planets. Others are lava planets and rocky planets. So there's so many interesting examples that you've been researching and learning about and then telling the public about. It must be overwhelming. Like, how do you choose what to study? Or how does JAXA or um, any aerospace space uh, organization, how do they choose what to spend the money on, what to put the research and development on. I'd love to know. Do you have any um, idea I've about that? Not really been involved in mission selection for JAXA. 
Um, as I understand it, and I add a postscript that I could be wrong here, is that people propose mission ideas and they do things like feasibility studies, risk studies, you know, can you keep it within the budget? Uh, all of those are taken into consideration. So certainly science value is very important in that, but so is the engineering. Like, is there challenges in engineering? Because that's also good. But are they in controlled risk? So we still think it's going to be successful. Uh, if we don't find what we expect, uh, is there is it still likely we'll come back with interesting information? Um, you know, how much is it going to cost? What's the kind of buffer zone on that if we start to overrun in cost? All those factors sort of um, have to be considered. So the mission idea is put forward and then it has to go through these project stages where everything is checked very, very thoroughly before you can proceed to the next step. So I believe you have a lot of projects at the beginning and then it gets slowly whittled down as each of those considerations are, are included. And of course, even later on when the project is sort of quite a long way through that, there's still a lot of changes that happen due to that process. So for example, uh, we have an upcoming mission called MMX, the Martian Moon Exploration Mission. And this is very exciting. It will go to, um, it will launch in the financial year of 2024, we hope. And it's off to Phobos, which is one of the two moons of Mars. And it will take a sample and return to Earth in 2029. And one of the interesting articles that one of our engineers wrote for our blog recently was how the spacecraft design had changed during their movement from like early stage project through to now and they considered things like what type of engine should we use should we use you know chemical engines or should we use electric propulsion you know how big should our solar panels be and that depends on how much sunlight you think you're going to get at mars but you don't want to make them too big because we have to land on phobos and a really big solar panel might hit the ground and that would be dangerous for the spacecraft and there's all these factors and as each factor is considered the spacecraft starts to change shape to allow for, you know, good power, but then also fast braking and also safe landing. And it's a really interesting process. Um, you were talking about how it's very difficult to know about the atmosphere unless you're there or unless you can see it or using the, you talk about the planetary wobble effect. Um, can you explain that a little bit about how you might be able to see the atmosphere? I love that comparison about twin planets between Venus and Earth, but the atmosphere is so different that you were talking about putting your hand on a hot plate and being crushed by a truck at the same time. Oh, Venus, not Earth. <laughs> Venus, not, not Earth, luckily, not yet. Yeah. Uh, yes, that was actually... Um... That was actually an analogy made by one of my uh, Venus studying colleagues, uh, Kevin McGoldrick, and it was very, very good, I think. Um, so to find out the atmosphere for an exoplanet, you obviously can't visit, it's just too far away. But you're right, it basically is the first indication of what we could, what would the planet would actually be like. So there's different methods that are being developed to actually probe the atmosphere. And one of them is that as the planet passes in front of the star, it does what we call a transit. So the planet is going to block out a little bit of that star's light. And that's one of the most common ways to actually detect the planet in the first place. Uh, however, if you look at that transit, so you look at the light being blocked out in different wavelengths, then you sometimes see the planet changes size very slightly depending on the wavelength you're looking at. And that's because a tiny bit of that light is not just passing through, is, is, is not just being blocked by the planet, it's gonna try and pass through the planet's atmosphere. So if the planet has certain molecules in it, it will absorb that light. And each molecule will absorb certain wavelengths. So if you have, you know, I, I'm very bad with numbers, so we're just gonna call this molecule X. A molecule X absorbs wavelengths that are exactly, you know, Y nanometers. <laughs> so if you are looking at Y nanometer wavelength, the planet appears bigger because the solid bit is blocking and the atmosphere is absorbing. So you don't get any light out. Now you change your wavelength a bit and look at that transit again. And suddenly the atmosphere molecules don't care about that light. So they just shoot straight through and the planet shrinks a little bit because the light is no longer being blocked by that atmosphere. So by looking at how the planet changes size very slightly depending on wavelength, you can work out which wavelengths are being blocked by the atmosphere. And then you know 
to some accuracy, <laughs> which molecules in the atmosphere are likely to absorb what wavelengths. So by knowing which wavelengths don't get through the atmosphere, you can extrapolate backwards and say, ah, therefore, I think these molecules must be in the atmosphere. And that's how they detected the presence of like water on that, uh, that probably that mini Neptune. And it's how we can um, do uh, other planets in a similar way. And there's going to be some really exciting telescopes coming up that are really dedicated to trying to do a survey of planetary atmospheres. One of them is the European Space Agency's aerial mission, which will launch in the late 2020s. And it's not going to be looking at kind of temperate planets like the Earth, but it's going to be trying to do a lot of quite hot planets that are close to their star. And that will give us a feel for really what kind of variety is out there? I mean, do they mainly have atmospheres similar to ours or maybe Venus or are they really very, very different? Like how much variety do we see out there? And another really exciting mission that JAX is involved in is actually going to be um, a Russian led observatory in the uh, ultraviolet. And JAXA has an instrument that will fly on that. And its job will actually be to distinguish between particularly Earth-like and Venus-like planets. And as it looks at the transit in the UV, the ultraviolet, it turns out that Venus will look quite a lot smaller than the Earth. So the Earth's atmosphere, the upper part of the Earth's atmosphere, I hope I'm getting this the right way around, I think I am, it will, it will block more light than a Venus-like planet will. So even if though the planets are actually the same size, when you look at them in the ultraviolet, they will look quite different. And that will be one way of distinguishing between an Earth and Venus. And one of the questions I'm really excited by is, you know, Venus is, is not, like I say, in a habitable zone. It gets more sunlight than Earth. But is that why it's Venus? Is it Was it that extra amount of sunlight that turned it into a Venus? Or actually, could you have a very Venus-like world around the same orbit of the Earth? And I, we don't yet know the answer. Uh, if you read a textbook on Venus, it will tell you it went through something called a runaway greenhouse and it was due to the extra sunlight. But the real story is a bit more complicated than that because it doesn't just look like an Earth with a lot of carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. It looks quite different on the surface. So that suggests that maybe even if it had been in a cooler part of the solar system, maybe even if it had been near Earth, it actually still would have been an uninhabitable hellhole. It just might not have evolved like us. So by being able to see where these Venus-like planets are and where perhaps these Earth-like planets are, we might get a much stronger feel of what makes a Venus and what makes an Earth. Wow, really interesting. I love the international collaboration of all the, the science breakthroughs. And even now, so you're talking about Venus and the photos from Venus um, and the sounds from Venus, I think I saw in Joe Scott the other day, um, is from the Russian... Uh, spaceships that went to Venus and only survived two hours or so, right? And then uh, recently the UAE has a Mars orbit and JAXA is saying, good job, way to go. And then uh, China as well is in orbit and JAXA is cheering them on. I, I love this international collaboration and I, I don't know, my impression of space missions in the US, uh, who's first to the moon. Is there a sense now more of collaborating on scientific research in space? Um, that's that's what it looks like. I, I hope that's true, because there's so much yeah, to learn from each other, right? It absolutely is true. I mean, one of the biggest factors is that it's very expensive to go to space. So no one really goes to space alone anymore. Um, typically, People might do it as perhaps a technology demonstration, but mainly missions have instruments by other space agencies on board. So you'll have a space agency leading a mission, but then it will have you know, a call for opportunities for other space agencies to say, hey, that sounds like a bit of OK. We'll be putting an instrument on there, please. And um, so, for instance, our, our upcoming Mars mission uh, will be carrying uh, a, an instrument uh, made by NASA. And it will also be carrying a rover uh, that's going to be made by the uh, German and French space agencies. And one of its sampling mechanisms it has two ways to sample Phobos. And one of those sampling mechanisms is also a NASA uh, design from the US. So it's, you know, it is really international. We are very much involved in each other's missions. And it should be, too, because many of the questions we're trying to answer and tackle are 
they're questions. They're not questions for Japan or they're not questions for America. They're questions for humanity. Like the Hayabusa 2 mission that recently returned to Earth, one of its key science goals is to try and unpick where the Earth received its water. So the Earth we think of as quite a water-rich planet, but in actual fact, by mass, we have very little water, but it just covers a lot of our surface. And one possible theory that's that's um, seriously considered is the Earth actually formed without any oceans, and they were delivered later in on the very young Earth by possibly incoming asteroids or comets that were formed in sort of colder regions of the solar system where you could freeze up some decent solid ice. And then you would, you know, get scattered inwards towards the inner planets, land on Earth and deliver the oceans. And possibly even with that, the first organic compounds that would later become part of our biology. So understanding how that delivery system works is sort of key for understanding where we came from and also key for understanding in general how do you get a habitable planet you know you might have a temperate planet but how does it go from that to being actually habitable and you know these aren't questions that only one country wants to answer these are questions we all want to know the answer to so i think it's it's wonderful that we collaborate and that we share results and that our missions have instruments from from different groups and different teams on them because the this is this is about our past and our future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think we're we're seeing that with coronavirus now too, right? We're we're seeing that vaccinations around the world helps everybody. Uh, sharing vaccines, sharing scientific research around the world helps everybody because the coronavirus does not distinguish what country you're from. <laughs> and uh, the same, right? We're we're Earth. What do you call Earthians? No, Earth people. Um, so we gotta I work together. I normally say humans, Joy. That's yes! typically the word I go for. <laughs> <laughs> Too much sci-fi. Too much sci-fi in my brain. Humans. Yes, that's what we're called. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, we have some comments. Donna says, lovely to listen to Elizabeth's story and her work. Thanks, Donna. Joan says, what is the name of the planet between Saturn and Neptune? Nerd alert. I don't know. Saturn and Neptune. So we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. I am not going to be caught out in that trick. Thank you very there much. You <laughs> there you go. You have heard it from the expert. Um, so one of the things you're talking about, the updates or the up and coming uh, telescopes, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I heard you mention about the Hubble. The Hubble is actually really old now, but it it's really depended upon for a lot of images. But there's a, a new version you just mentioned, which is coming out. That's pretty exciting, huh? Um, so the telescope I just mentioned was Ariel. Ariel is not a Hubble replacement. Ariel is very much an atmosphere sniffer for exoplanets. That is its raison d'etre. That's why it's going up there. But the telescope I think you're thinking of is the JWST, which is kind of pegged as the Hubble successor, although it, it is quite a different telescope. Um, that's the James Webb Space Telescope and will be launching. The launch date keeps changing, but in the next few years, shall we say. Uh, and that, that will be an amazing instrument as well. And it will, but it's multi-purpose. It won't just do exoplanets as much as I would like to take all the JWS time, JWS T time for exoplanets. I, I personally feel that would be a great use, but there's apparently other people out there who want to use it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and, but for exoplanets, and it has got a big exoplanet program planned, it will also be doing a bit of this atmosphere sniffing. And it may even be able to have a go at detecting the atmosphere on a planet that is maybe sort of Earth sized and has a similar amount of sunlight to us. So is in the so-called habitable zone. And even if it could only do one or two of those sort of planets, it would be really fascinating because like, what are we talking about here? Do they typically have atmosphere compositions that are similar to us? Or, you know, is that really not very likely every statistical point we get on that will be amazing. So it's, it's going to be a very exciting instrument. That's great. Um, let's track back a little bit and just explain a little bit more about the Hayabusa 2, because right when you started, they were in orbit. Is that right? And so you saw a lot of the exciting results coming in. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, so Hayabusa 2 launched in, it wouldn't be bad if I got this wrong, I'm pretty sure it's 2014. <laughs> 
December 2014. At the time, I was at Hokkaido uh, still as a professor there. And I had started this uh, blog for the university where which, you know, basically once a month or so, I would go and talk to a researcher and cover their uh, their research. And no one really directed me on this. So it was a bit of a random walk around the university, sort of based on hearsay of what I overheard in the cafeteria. <laughs> and ended up being very uh, physics and astrophysics biased purely because that was what I tended to hear in the cafeteria. Um, but I heard a rumor that there was a professor here working on the Hayabusa 2 mission, and he was uh, Shogo Tachibana, who is now at the University of Tokyo. And I went and visited him and I said, please tell me all about the Hayabusa 2 mission. So I wrote an article uh, on that based on Shogo's explanation of the whole mission. And then one year later, the a uh, spacecraft did a close pass by the Earth. So it's on its way to the asteroid, but it takes a slightly circuitous route and it does it to swing by the Earth one more time to get a gravitational punch, more gentle than that, but <laughs> a gravitational kick that allows it to go onto an orbit that's very close to the asteroid. So it uses our planet's gravity to get that kind of shove. Um, and around that time, uh, Shogo actually connected me up with the Hayabusa 2 mission manager, who's Makoto Yoshikawa. And he said, Elizabeth knows about the mission. She's very excited by it. She would like to help you with the English outreach. So at that point, even though I was still at Hokkaido, I started to work a little bit with the team. And then one year after that, I actually joined JAXA officially. And Yoshikawa-san and myself worked much more closely in trying to translate as much as possible so that it all came out in English and Japanese. And then the the mission itself arrived at asteroid Ryugu in June 2018. And that was when things got really exciting because, of course, images were pouring in. And then we started the surface operations. It was it was an amazing mission. We had um, in total three rovers and a lander were dropped to the surface and the spacecraft itself touched down twice to collect two different samples from the asteroid surface before eventually coming home. So, it, yeah. It was an amazing, um, amazing time to be part of the mission. And the outreach articles were incredibly exciting. And as we cl clarified, with Google Translate's help, I translated these into, Jap in, into from Japanese into English. And we were able to do really good bilingual outreach. And we got a lot of press coverage as a result. So it was wonderful to see that being paid off as well and see you know, articles in the, on the BBC and the New York Times based on what you were translating for the team. Uh, I, though I think I have a very artificial view of space missions because Hayabusa 2 went so completely smoothly that I now just think, well, th these things always work out right. What's the problem? <laughs> of course, actually, it was a very difficult mission with a lot of preparation and things are not always that smooth. So, <laughs> yeah. well, great. It's very exciting. And the whole idea of landing on an asteroid to find out more about what happened to earth as it was made is that right and then digging yes. below the surface because the under surface material might have more to study is that right right so the the spacecraft itself couldn't land and dig that's actually quite hard on a very low gravity body although our mars mission will be attempting to do something similar on phobos but hyobus 2 just dropped down but you're right we did want subsurface material so although asteroid ryugu is obviously a lot smaller than the earth and we don't have a complex weathering system or anything like that you do suffer from something called space weathering and that comes from, you know, radiation from the sun that kind of sunburns the surface a bit. You can get cosmic rays. Basically, the outer crust of that asteroid can become changed. So if you really want to know, you know, what is what is real asteroid? What is what is this asteroid really made of? Because that's the kind of material that would have slammed into the early Earth before these changes occurred. You really want to skim off that top layer. So the way Hayabusa 2 did this is it dropped what we called a small carry-on impactor, or SCI, which is really an explosive. So it dropped the explosive, it ran and hid behind the asteroid so as it didn't get hit by the debris. The explosive came down and uh, shot into the asteroid in a very, very fast projectile and created uh, the world's first, actually, artificial crater. Um, and then the spacecraft came back up and it was it didn't land actually in the crater because that was a bit of a dangerous landing location. But by comparing images before and after that crater had been generated, you saw sort of where the debris had become scattered. 
So the spacecraft touched down where we thought the debris had been spread out and therefore was able to gather part of that subsurface material that we think is more pristine than what might be on the surface. And therefore, if there is a difference between the surface material and the subsurface material, it's that subsurface material that you think is more similar to what hit the early Earth. So that's the one that's maybe slightly more relevant for uh, deciding what happened to the early planet and whether it had a delivery of this water and these uh, organics. Have there been any studies released about what was found or was there anything like exciting that you didn't expect? Um, I think in your book you were talking about sometimes you have these theories, they make a lot of sense. And then when you get more data, you're like, actually, that theory is wrong. So was there anything like that with the samples from the asteroid that kind of blew your mind? So it's still, <laughs> it's still too early for the samples. The okay. samples only came back at the end, end of December. So at the moment, they're in a curation laboratory in Sagamahara, just outside Tokyo. And um, there's many steps to their analysis. So one of the first is that they all have to be opened in this vacuum environment, which makes obviously handling them very difficult. And some of them are going to be preserved for later analysis in the future. And some are going to be uh, divided up for different experiments. And then an initial analysis will be done. So I don't think we'll get much in the way of results from that for maybe six months. And even then, it will be preliminary. It will take a long time to really squeeze the science out of this. However, there have been a lot of scientific papers already released just based on the instrument suite that the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft was carrying. So one was, you know, how how strong and tough is this asteroid and what is its age and trying to map the history of Ryugu, like what happened to it since it formed. And uh, we believe that it once was part of a larger body. That isn't surprising. We expected that. Uh, an asteroid that is sort of near the Earth, the chances are it started off further out in the asteroid belt. And then it went through some sort of breakup process, perhaps due to a collision. And then a fragment has sort of come closer to our planet. Uh, and we think Ryugu is one of those. But it also seems that the asteroid took a certain uh, deviating tour much closer to the sun than we expected because the surface seems to be changed, looks, uh, looks basically sunburned. And that suggests that the asteroid's path actually was perhaps much closer to the sun than it is now and it's moved back out. So trying to plot that history to understand, you know, what happens to these asteroids, how far into the solar system do they move, uh, is all part of the process in understanding how material can move through the solar system and deliver organics and vice versa. Um, so that that is definitely underway. I think it will be a little while before we have a, a really concrete picture, but we have sort of tantalizing glimpses through these papers so far. Wow, that's it's really exciting and interesting. Do you have to get international approval before you do any kind of blast in space or blast of asteroid? Like in terms of collaboration, is there some kind of like activity which might endanger the Earth or something? Like, is there an approval process? So for... um, the approval process, there may be others I'm not aware of. The one I am aware of is something called planetary protection. And that's mainly concerned actually with potential biological matter. Like if you bring a sample back to Earth, could you accidentally cause you know, an Andromeda strain, <laughs> uh, which we certainly don't want as we've all just experienced the coronavirus. Um, and also the, uh, to be honest, a bigger risk is also if you go to a place where there might be biology, you don't want to contaminate it with Earth's biology because then all your science is destroyed. Uh, so you have to be very careful considering that. So for example, asteroids are not considered, even though we're looking at the generation of the Earth's water and possible early organics, they're not considered places where life could exist. So there was no concern really that the Hyobusa 2 sample would pose any danger at all to the Earth. But one thing I believe the team did have to prove is that supposing something goes wrong with the spacecraft and they lose control of it, what is the chance, for example, of it hitting Mars? Now, Mars's surface is not habitable, um, but there is the possibility that there might be evidence of life beneath the surface, maybe evidence of water. And of course, it's uh, we're all very excited for that at the moment because um, NASA Perseverance rover is landing later this week and it's going to one of the top possible biological sites of interest uh, 
to at the Jezero crater to um, to see possibly if there's signs of life there or were signs of life in the past. So when you have uh, a spacecraft that might be anywhere close to that facility, you have to do a lot of calculations to show if something went wrong here or here or here or here, the orbit for the next 50 years is very unlikely to hit anything important, including the Earth, but also, you know, Mars and maybe cause contamination. So I know the team had to go through that very carefully. Of course, computers are very important in terms of uh, running data or communicating with your robot, which is out in space. Um, and you also talk about AI helping to even find planets. Um, and I know that you're doing a lot of work with virtual reality as well. Um, how does that fit into the kind of work that you're doing? Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure, there's sort of two different separate projects here. Um, there's the possibility of machine learning helping you plow through data. And it's not just planets, it can be many areas and not just astrophysics either, but places where you basically have huge data sets. And often where you might have a pattern or a trend, but it doesn't just depend on one or two properties. So, for example, if you have property X depends on property Y, like, for example, planet mass depends on planet radius, then if that was the only thing linking those two properties, you could plot it very easily on a graph. You could have mass going down here, radius that way. And then you as a human could quite easily say, oh, look, there's a trend as the mass goes up, the radius goes up. But... Supposing we now add in composition to this question. So if you have all planets were identical to the Earth, then you would see definitely a very clear trend between mass and radius. But what about Jupiter? Jupiter is a gas giant. Its main part of its volume is hydrogen and helium gas. It's really light. So it's not going to sit on that very clear trend. There's going to be sort of two trends for sort of rocky planets and then the sort of gas giants. Well, OK, you can maybe still handle that as a human. But what if I said, well, ah, rock, rock can be different. I mean, there's silicate rocks on the Earth. But supposing we had a lot more carbon in the system. So instead of forming silicate oxide, we're going to form silicate carbide. And that's got a different density structure. So now suddenly your mass and radius diagram, as your radius increases, your mass is going to increase at a different rate. Now let's add in another constitution and say, ah, actually many of these planets, they formed further out in their solar system where it was much colder. So although they're small and solid and not gas giants, they could prize of lots of ice and water. So that means as their radius goes up, and they're getting more and more water, their mass is not going to go up as fast as if they were made from silicate rocks like the Earth. Or maybe you could flip it and say, hey, this is a really iron rich system. So the Earth has an iron core, but maybe these exoplanets have giant iron cores. And so as their radius goes up, I mean, their mass is just going to go really, really heavy. So suddenly you can no longer plot the relation between mass and radius on a simple graph that is easy for humans to see. Because it depends, you know, the radius doesn't just depend on mass. It depends on composition. It depends on, you know, where you're forming. It depends on, you know all sorts of things, <laughs> you know, maybe the temperature of the system, that sort of thing. And so you've got all these parameters. And at that point, this is where machine learning handles it much better, because machine learning doesn't necessarily care how many parameters are needed to explain a trend, it can just find it. So one of the things I've been doing in my research is to use neural networks, which are a type of machine learning, to try and find trends and patterns, and use these to predict properties we haven't been able to measure. So if we have a planet where we have the radius, but we don't have the mass, then the machine learning can look at a lot more data and say, OK, well, based on the radius, but also based on its orbital period and on the brightness of that star and on the other elements I see in the system, I think the mass is going to be you know, X or Y. So that's been one side in which machine learning has been really exciting. And it's true for any big data set where you've got a lot of factors influencing what you want to study. Now, the virtual reality, on the other hand, um, is also really exciting. And I was interested in it before we ended all up in a pandemic, but it's perhaps even more apt now we're all stuck at home. Uh, and that is the ability to view things in 3D. So 
for example, I'm trying to tell you what asteroid Ryugu is like. You know, the Hayabusa 2 mission went and visited a brand new world that we've never seen before. But it's not like Earth. Asteroids are very different. They don't have an atmosphere. You know, it's really a sort of rubble pile of rocks and space. Like, how can I really describe to you what that's like? And of course, we have lots of pictures, but they're all very 2D. Now, with virtual reality, you could build a 3D environment of that asteroid Ryugu. And you could actually stand there and be able to look around you and say, oh, OK, now I understand the size of these craters. Now I understand what this rocky environment is. And we've been doing some experiments of that with one of my colleagues uh, in Princeton to look at, uh, you know, whether you can build these virtual reality environments and what they could be used for. Uh, maybe the first one is for outreach and education. So. I want to tell you about asteroid Ryugu. Why don't we just go there and stand there and then I'll tell you about asteroid Ryugu. And you could imagine doing it for all sorts of classes. You want to teach a class about Jupiter's moon Io. Well, why not just take them to the surface of Io and see the incredible volcanoes of the solar system there and then explain to them you know, how they're generated. So That's I think amazing. it's got a lot of potential. Yeah. I, it's still I a little that... bit of the early stages. Yeah, that's that's really exciting. I'm sure that'll get a lot more, uh, like you often talk about youth outreach. I think that'll get a lot more young people involved and interested for sure. Um, I know a lot of tourist sites, because nobody can travel right now, a lot of tourist destinations are doing something similar and like a virtual walkthrough. I never even thought of that possibility on planets or asteroids. How exciting. Absolutely. I think it's got a huge amount of potential and it, it means that we're all stuck at home at the moment. But I think that kind of VR, it gives you something that actually wouldn't have been available to you, even if you weren't stuck at home. And even if we consider things like planetariums, they're often only accessible to people who live in cities, whereas virtual reality, it, it needs a good Internet connection. So it, it's maybe not universally available, but it is available to a lot more people than an inner city planetarium might be. And the headsets of VR are really coming down in price now. They no longer require powerful gaming comp computers to use. So you have a much lower entry point to, to what you did. Really exciting. Um, speaking of the future, I wanted to ask you what, what, and this is maybe not your area of expertise, but what do you think would speed up our knowledge of space? What is the biggest hurdle? Is it financial? Is it manpower? Is it lack of education from a young level to develop the creativity to think in different ways? Like what would really move things forward in terms of space exploration? It's a big question. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure of the answer, to be honest. Um, I think partly because perhaps the question is a bit too broad because it depends what you're interested in. I mean, are you interested in humans leaving the Earth or are you interested in scientific discovery? Because they've both got quite different paths. So, you know, my main interest is scientific discovery. Um, and obviously, you know, if you gave me more money, that would be very nice <laughs> uh, to do more robotic missions. Um, I would personally, that's, that's I mean, if you gave me a choice, you know, that's what I would say. I'd be like, look, as I mentioned before, we've got all these mission ideas, but they get slowly whittled down to just funding a few. H how about we just why don't we just fund all of them? I mean, you know, let's just go out there and build more telescopes and send more probes to more planets. I mean, we have a sample from asteroid Ryugu and we're getting another sample actually in the next few years from the NASA OSIRIS-REx mission, which is going to a different asteroid. And having samples from two different asteroids is incredible. The teams are working very closely together and they will actually share samples. And the reason it's so important is that you never know whether you've accidentally got an atypical example. Like we're about to say sweeping things about how the Earth may have got its water or its early organics. But supposing Ryugu is just not typical and it's very unusual, then can we say for sure that the conclusions we're reaching are going to be generally true? Uh, but if you have another sample from asteroid Bennu this time and it has similar results, you can say with a lot more confidence uh, that what you're finding is perhaps universally true. And these really are the type of rocks that would have struck the young Earth. Uh, back in its infancy when it was sort of vaguely contemplating being a habitable planet. But 
what if you had a hundred Hayabusa twos? Now that you're talking about a serious sample selection. <laughs> so that's what I'd really like, you know, more missions. But I suspect you could ask, you know, 10 or a hundred different astrophysicists and they'd all be interested in a slightly different aspect of space exploration and therefore they give you a different answer. Well, I think that's, that's a good answer. It's money, but it's also mind power and it's also political will. I'm sure there's there's a lot of things involved. Now, a really important question because you're in Japan, of course, now you have manhole covers um, for, <laughs> for the Hayabusa too. Do you have a mascot or do you have a gacha gacha of toy? <laughs> of course we have a mascot. What a... What? Naturally, like you say, we're in Japan. <laughs> now, you know you've made it as a mission when you actually have manhole covers. And it's it's true. The Hayabusa 2 mission, uh, as of, I think, in within the last week, has got commemorative manhole covers that are going to be in the city of Sagamahara. Uh, so if you are in the sort of Tokyo wider region, do come and check them out. There's one just outside Fichinobi Station on the uh, Yokohama Sen Line. And there's also one in the Sagamahara Museum. And I am very excited to go and check these out, I have to say. Uh, but we also do have our mascot. We have Hayatukan, who is um, a cheerful, blue-footed, yellow spacecraft with the same shape as Hayabusa 2 and even has his own Twitter feed. So if you would like to hear about, you know, Hayabusa 2 from the mouth of Hayabusa 2, then uh, Hayatukan is a Twitter feed to check out. And he normally tweets in Japanese, but we have done a few tweets in English for Hayatukan. Uh, during October in 2018, we were dropping the mascot lander. Now, mascot is like a shoebox sized laboratory, and it was uh, designed and built by the German and French space agencies, the same team that will be doing the rover, actually, for uh, our Mars mission. And um, mascot had a Twitter feed, and we did some conversations between Hayatukun and mascot about, you know, the deployment onto asteroid Ryugu and what it hoped to find and talk to them more lively and friendly way but while still giving information so they were quite fun conversations to read but we also hope that you learned something about what we were doing uh, so that's been having a mascot has been really fun that's great uh, we have a comment from facebook wendy has joined us thanks wendy uh, she says i snooped on your webpage and saw space for live events but none scheduled it would be great to have my students listen to you speak at some point what an amazing path you have had and great to see what lies ahead of you. Wonderful. Thanks, Wendy. Um, Thank you, Wendy. Do you do speaking uh, like events now during coronavirus online or anything? I do them online. Um, so, I mean, people people ask. I do them when I can. Sometimes partly because it's gone online, uh, the number of requests have got quite high. And I, I think eventually JAXA will get very annoyed if I st stop doing my job. So <laughs> I do have to pace them out a little bit. Um, but uh, I, I definitely do events. I've got um, actually one coming up for uh, Trinity College Dublin actually next month, which will be online and possibly the link will be public for that. So I, I must remember to update my web page with uh, the links for that. Um, but I mean, do ask. Uh, I can't always do it if I'm busy, but I do try. And I appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Um, one of the, I, I learned so many things from, there's a lot of things I have to admit that in your book I did not understand and I just glossed over, but I just kept reading and then I would pick up some interesting bits. So I would recommend it to anybody interested in space. And I think you do a great job of explaining so much. Um, one of the things which I think is, is interesting because an earthquake just happened yesterday which you probably <laughs> felt in tokyo is the whole idea of the tectonic plates being an important part of our atmosphere that i'd never thought of before can you just is that too difficult to explain in a few minutes <laughs> i mean it goes pretty deep into planetary science so people take what i say with you know topmost grain of salt here but there are many things about our earth that make our environment what it is and one of them absolutely is the tectonic plates so the crust of the earth is snapped into these plates and they do a lot of recycling so they um, 
they allow uh, heat to move from the core to the surface. And that's very important for driving our magnetic field, for example, which protects our atmosphere. And they also subduct, as in they go underneath each other. So while that can create earthquakes and volcanoes, which aren't necessarily the greatest, um, it also allows nutrients to be cycled through the planet. So it allows more food than if the crust was absolutely static. And the presence of volcanoes is certainly very important to the atmosphere because it allowed outgassing from the early planet. So the gases that were trapped inside the planet were able to be gassed out and then form our first atmosphere that eventually was changed by things like biology. So if you have what we call you know, a static, uh, static lid where you don't have um, any plate tectonics, we're not sure how habitable that planet could be. We don't really have enough examples to be certain. It's possible that there would be other ways of, um, of creating a similar effect, but it's also possible that it would become dead and static, and that would be a big problem. Notably, neither Mars nor Venus have plate tectonics. So there's two data points that suggest it's not so great <laughs> to not have that. But one of the questions we have is, how do you get plate tectonics? Um, is it just the amount, right amount of sunlight? And if you form the Earth again, no problem, we'd have it again. Or is it a stochastic process where you could form the Earth from scratch and just this time not end up with plate tectonics? These are some of the questions we'd really like to know and some of the questions we might start to answer as we start probing the atmosphere of other planets. That's really interesting. And there is so much more to learn. Uh, I don't want to take up, we only have a few more minutes. Um, in terms of writing more books, are you interested in writing more books or you kind of focused on other areas of research or what's what's coming up for you? What are you excited yeah. about? The problem with books, I loved writing The Planet Factory. It was amazing, but it was like having a second job for two and a half years. Um, so it's it's a bit of a big commitment. I would like to write another one, but at the moment I'm very busy at JAXA. Um, so it, it will be hard to fit in basically a second job on top of what I'm already doing for JAXA. So I think at the moment I haven't got immediate plans to write another book. Um, I have just done a, an academic book where I was the writer and senior editor for it, uh, which was a different type of project. Uh, so it's not it's not a book I'd necessarily recommend unless you're one of the five people I targeted it at. <laughs> but it was, you know, it's, it was a different project and it was really exciting. And I really enjoyed working with a team on that one. And that looked at particularly like, what does it take to be Earth-like? You know, supposing you took an Earth and you just tweaked one of the dials, maybe you tweaked the composition or you tweaked the magnetic field or you just changed the amount of sort of volatiles like water we had, what sort of results do we expect to come out of that? And the sort of take home message from that book is that you can be incredibly Earth-like, only very slightly different and get a really different planet. So, you know, when we consider what we're looking for, when we look, beyond our solar system, we have to remember that it's not going to be identical to us because even a small change can create a very different environment. And we've got to be ready for that so that we understand the data that we get back from these exoplanets. That sounds interesting, but yes, maybe a little bit too above my, my pay grade. <laughs> You just um, need I need to go back to school fine. for a little while first. Um, but one of the things that I think for me is a big takeaway um, from a lot of the lectures and your book and everything is that there is no planet B. Not right now and maybe not in the near future. So this idea that we don't have to worry about climate change, we don't have to worry about what we're doing to this planet, um, I think this planet sounds pretty special and there's nothing that we can just move to um, right yeah. away and live on. Is, is that pretty much a good Absolutely. take away? Uh, completely. <laughs> I mean, even if we were to say that every single Earth-sized planet is identical to Earth, which no chance, people, no chance at all. But even if we were to say that, the distance the interstellar distance you're talking about, we're not even ready to begin that kind of journey. So I'm not, I don't want to never say never. Like, could we ever visit an exoplanet? I mean, maybe one day, but you're talking about a transgenerational starship and humans have never traveled beyond the moon so far. 
So it's it's so far in the future that I don't find it scientifically terribly interesting. I love it from the sci-fi point of view. That's amazing. But in terms of like scientific interest, it's pretty minimal because it's just so far in the future that we can't even work on something directly connected with it. So, you know, the best you could possibly hope for would be living in a small cramped conditions in space if you blow up this planet. And I certainly don't fancy it because I had enough of living in my apartments during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I suspect conditions would be an awful lot more cramped in space. <laughs> you had to choose a kind of maybe might happen kind of sci-fi movie. Would The Martian be closest? Cause he yeah, was, probably. He had, <laughs> he had to in a, and maybe not Arnold Schwarzenegger's one where they change the atmosphere on Mars. No, at a drop I don't of think the hat. terraforming isn't really on the cards. We don't know how to do it. And actually, interestingly, we sort of talked about, you know, was there is there even possible to terraform Mars? Has it got enough water and ice to do it, even if you had the technology? And some people have suggested yes, but most people have suggested no, uh, even if that technology existed, which it absolutely doesn't. There's not even enough water on Mars to be able to make those changes. So, yeah, I would say probably The Martian, I feel, is one of the more realistic ones I've seen. I certainly enjoyed it a lot, <laughs> uh, but it didn't really appeal to me as a future either. So, <laughs> I mean, he was pretty keen to get off the planet as well. I think we should all note that from the movie. <laughs> and uh, you kind of lose your love of potatoes somehow by walking yeah. watching that. <laughs> uh, Selena has joined thanks Selena she says thank you Elizabeth you are so good at explaining these it's like you're a science communicator somehow <laughs> how nice <laughs> thank you so much for joining and for explaining all these big ideas I think um, it's really important for us to think about outer space learn from outer space learn from you and your research and how we can take advantage or appreciate more what we have and take care of it a little bit better. I think there's a lot of great lessons here. So thank you so much. Thank you. And I think in terms of branding, this is great that you're you're working so well and helping to communicate what JAXA is doing. It sounds really exciting. So I'll, I'll be following your Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. I, I think the Jack submissions are incredible, honestly. Uh, I think we've got some really exciting things coming up. And I really hope that people will follow us on the journey. Yeah, definitely. I've put the link below um, for the JAXA website, which is in English and Japanese. You guys are also communicating a lot through Twitter, which is nice. And uh, you have a Facebook page, I believe, as well. I'm not sure about Facebook. Um, I, I normally do the Twitter feeds for the Institute of Space and Astronautical Sciences, ISAS for JAXA. Yeah. And then for you personally, people can find you on Twitter, YouTube and Instagram. Is that right? Uh, mainly, mainly Twitter for me. Mainly Twitter. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing your insights with us. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Everyone have a good day, take care, and we'll see you with more talks next week. So see you next week. Uh, thinking about dreaming about space tonight, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Bye. Thank you.